Order. I call Secretary of State Dominic Raab to make a statement. Secretary of State. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And with your permission, I'd like to make a statement updating the House on the latest developments with respect to China and in particular Hong Kong. As I told the House on the 1st of July, the UK wants a positive relationship with China. China has undergone an extraordinary transformation in recent decades, grounded in one of the world's ancient cultures. Not only is China the world's second largest economy, it has a huge base in tech and science. The UK government recognises China's remarkable success in raising millions of its own people out of poverty. China is also the world's biggest investor in renewable technology, so it will be an essential global partner when it comes to tackling global climate change. And the Chinese people travel, study and work all over the world, making an extraordinary contribution. So, Mr Speaker, let me be really clear about this. We want to work with China. There is enormous scope for positive, constructive engagement. There are wide-ranging opportunities, from increasing trade to cooperation in tackling climate change, as I have said, in particular with a view to the COP26 summit next year, which the UK will, of course, be hosting. But as we strive for that positive relationship, we are also clear-sighted about the challenges that lie ahead. We will always protect our vital interests, including sensitive infrastructure, and we won't accept any investment that compromises our domestic or national security. Mr Speaker, we will be clear where we disagree, and I have been clear about our grave concerns regarding the gross human rights abuses being perpetrated against the Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang. And, Mr Speaker, it is precisely because we recognise China's role in the world as a fellow member of the G20, a fellow permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, that we expect China to live up to the international obligations and the international responsibilities that come with that stature. That is the positive, constructive, the mature, the reciprocal relationship that we seek with China. Striving for good cooperation, honest and clear where we have to disagree. And Mr Speaker, we have been clear regarding the new national security law which China has imposed on the people of Hong Kong. A clear and serious violation of the UK-China joint declaration and with it a violation of China's freely assumed international obligations. On the 1st of July I announced that we are developing a bespoke immigration route for British nationals overseas and their dependents, giving them a path to citizenship in the UK. And I can update the House that the Home Secretary will set out further details on the plans for a new bespoke immigration route for BNOs and their dependents before recess. This bespoke route will be ready by early 2021. In the meantime, the Home Secretary has already given Border Force officers the ability to grant leave to BNOs and their accompanying dependents at the UK border. Mr Speaker, beyond our offer to BNOs, today we are taking two further measures, which are a necessary and proportionate response to this new national security legislation, which we have now had the opportunity to assess very carefully. First, given the role China has now assumed for the internal security of Hong Kong and the authority it is exerting over law enforcement, the UK will extend to Hong Kong the arms embargo that we have applied to mainland China since 1989. To be clear, the extension of this embargo will mean there will be no exports from the UK to Hong Kong of potentially lethal weapons, their components or ammunition. And it will also mean a ban on the export of any equipment not already banned which might be used for internal repression, such as shackles, intercept equipment, firearms and smoke grenades. Mr Speaker, the second measure uh, relates to the fact that the imposition of this new national security legislation has significantly changed key assumptions underpinning our extradition treaty arrangements with Hong Kong. And I have to say I am particularly concerned about Articles 55 to 59 of the law, which give mainland China, uh, Chinese authorities the ability to assume jurisdiction over certain cases and to try those cases in mainland Chinese courts. Mr Speaker, the national security law does not provide legal or judicial safeguards in such cases. I am also concerned about the potential reach of the extraterritorial provisions. So I have consulted with the Home Secretary, the Justice Secretary and the Attorney General and the Government has decided to suspend the extradition treaty immediately and indefinitely. 
And I should also tell the House that we would not consider reactivating those arrangements unless and until there are clear uh, and robust safeguards which are able to prevent extradition from the UK being misused under the new national security legislation. Mr Speaker, there remains considerable uncertainty about the way in which the new national security law will be enforced. I would just say this, the United Kingdom is watching and the whole world is watching. And in the last few weeks, I've been engaged with many of our international partners in a concerted dialogue about how we should best respond to the unfolding events that we're seeing in Hong Kong. On the 8th of July, I spoke with our Five Eyes Foreign Minister partners. We agreed on the seriousness of China's actions and the importance of pressing Beijing to meet its international obligations. I welcome the fact that Australia, Canada and the US have taken a range of measures with respect to Hong Kong, including variously export controls and extradition, as we are taking today. I also discussed the situation with our European partners, uh, including Joseph Borrell, the EU's High Representative for Foreign Affairs, and the UK Government also welcomes the EU announcement on the 13th of July, which sets out further proposed measures in response to the national security legislation. A number of our international partners are also considering what offers they may be willing to make to the people of Hong Kong following the UK offer in relation to BNOs. And so I can reassure the House we will continue to take a leading role in engaging and in coordinating our actions with our international partners as befits our historic commitment to the people of Hong Kong. Mr Speaker, as I said at the outset, we want a positive relationship with China. There is a huge amount to be gained for both countries. There are many areas where we can work productively, constructively to mutual benefit together. For our part, the UK will work hard and in good faith towards that goal. But we will protect our vital interests. We will stand up for our values and we will hold China to its international obligations. The specific measures I have announced today are a reasonable and proportionate response to China's failure to live up to those international obligations with respect to Hong Kong. And I commend this statement to the House. Yeah. Yeah. And now come to Shadow Foreign Secretary, Lisa Nandy. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Foreign Secretary for his statement and for advance sight of it? And can I be clear that we strongly welcome both of the measures that he has announced today? He is right to ensure that Britain doesn't allow our exports to be used against the people of Hong Kong. And can I thank him warmly for taking this step forwards? I am particularly glad that the Government has listened to my honourable friend, the Shadow Secretary of State for International Trade, and suspended the export of surveillance equipment to go alongside the suspension of the export of crowd control equipment, which was demanded of uh, the Government by the Labour opposition last year. Will he go further and also review the training of the Hong Kong police by the Royal College of Policing and other UK police forces mm. to ensure that we are uh, playing a part in helping to uphold and not suppress the rights of the people of Hong Kong. Can I also welcome the indefinite suspension of the extradition treaty and the safeguards that he announced today. It affords protection to the Hong Kong diaspora community here in the UK and particularly to the brave young pro-democracy activists who I recently had the pleasure to meet. We believe it is vital that the, the world shows a coordinated front on this. And I was heartened to hear that he'd had discussions with our Five Eyes partners. Canada, Australia and the USA have already taken this step. Will he speak to other key allies, including Germany, to ensure there is a coordinated international response? He also made no mention of our Commonwealth partners. Has he reached out to those Commonwealth countries who have extradition treaties with Hong Kong to ensure that BNO passport holders and pro-democracy activists can travel freely without fear of arrest and extradition. Mr Speaker, there are a number of other steps that the Foreign Secretary could take. He made a commitment today that the UK will not accept investment that compromises our national security. Can he confirm then that this will extend to the proposed nuclear power project at Bradwell? And can he tell us what assessment the Government has made of the security implications of Sizewell C?
Elections are due to take place in Hong Kong in the autumn, and we are concerned that just as in the case of Joshua Wong, the Chinese government may seek to bar candidates from standing. A clear statement from the Foreign Secretary today that candidates selected through the primary process are legitimate and must be allowed to stand in those elections would send a message that, as he says, the world is watching. Can I also ask him to work internationally to ensure independent election observers are allowed into Hong Kong in order to oversee those elections. Mm. Mr Speaker, he was a little irritated by my suggestion yesterday that the UK ought to impose Magnitsky sanctions on Chinese officials involved in persecuting the Uyghur people and undermining basic freedoms in Hong Kong. But may I gently say to him that we have known that the Uyghur have been detained in camps since at least 2017. Can I ask him if any work at all has been done on this by the Foreign Office, and given that the USA has already imposed similar sanctions, is he working with our US counterparts to build the case for UK sanctions, and will he discuss this with the US Secretary of State tomorrow when he meets him? Mr Speaker, he may not have done the groundwork that would enable him to impose Magnitsky sanctions now, but his government does have the power right now to take action. He could, for example, as the US has done, bar CCP officials from the UK. Why hasn't he done it? The Chinese ambassador said yesterday that he reserved the right to take action against British companies. What discussions has he had with British companies operating in China to offer advice and assistance? I've asked him a number of times whether he's had discussions with HSBC and Standard Chartered about their stated support for the national security law. He must condemn that support. We should be showing the best of British business, not the worst of British business to the world. I was pleased to hear he's had discussions with Australia and New Zealand about them making a similar offer to BNO passport holders, but we are concerned, after asking a range of parliamentary questions, that there are serious holes in this offer. Um, we have been told by the government that the BNO passport holders will not uh, and their families will not receive home status for tuition fees, that they will ha not have access to most benefits, that they will have to pay the NHS surcharge. This seems to me to be wrong. We are welcoming BNO passport holders to the UK for similar reasons to refugees but these measures are completely out of step. Without serious action before these proposals are published, we will essentially be offering safe harbour only to the rich and highly skilled. Now, that may benefit the UK, but it lacks the generosity and moral clarity that this situation demands. He will also know that many young pro-democracy activists are too young to be eligible for BNO passports. The Home Secretary said last week that she was considering a specific scheme for 18 to 23-year-olds. Will those details also be published before summer and can he provide more detail today. Mr Speaker, finally, this must mark the start of a more strategic approach to China based on an ethical approach to foreign policy and an end to the naivety of the golden era years. And if it does, he can be assured that he will have our full support on this side of the House. Like him, our quarrel is not with the people of China. But the erosion of freedoms in Hong Kong, the actions of the Chinese government in the South China Sea and the appalling treatment of the Uyghur people is reason now to act. We will not be able to say in future years that we did not know and I urge him to work with colleagues across government to ensure that this marks the start of a strategic approach to China uh, and the start of a new era. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I um, thank uh, the Honourable Lady for her response and, in particular, her support for the two measures we're taking today, suspending the extradition treaty arrangements and extending the arms embargo. Uh, I might note that there's a, uh, a drastically different tone being taken from the front bench from uh, even a few weeks ago, uh, but we welcome her support and will do so in a spirit of cross-party uh, uh, endeavour and the importance of sending a very clear signal um, to Beijing and, indeed, to our international partners as where we stand. She, she asked about the review of policing. Of course, she, she's right about that. It's a question of balance. We'll keep that under constant review. Um, she mentioned a range of points about BNO, um, uh, the details on it. They will be set forward by the Home Secretary shortly in the way I described. I would urge her uh, to wait for the detail before critiquing it. Um, the Home Secretary and the Home Office have been doing a huge amount of work since September last, week, uh, last year on all of this. Uh, and of course, we also need to bear in mind the other offers that other countries quite rightly and uh, usefully will be making. 
On international coordination, um, we, uh, I, I welcome what she said. Uh, she's right uh, about the um, importance of uh, working with my German opposite number. I'm seeing him this week. Uh, it's something which is squarely on the agenda. We've also already obviously through the Five Eyes membership uh, touch base with a number of our Commonwealth colleagues but I'll continue to do that. I think she's right about this point. It needs to be more than just the Europeans uh, and uh, the UK with the North Americans, the, the traditional Five Eyes and Europeans because there's a whole range of non-aligned countries out there who uh, are very much influenced by what China is doing and saying and we want them to support us in upholding the international rule of law which in all areas including as she mentioned the South China Sea will be very important. Uh, on investments, uh, we rigorously review uh, not just all investments into this country from the security point of view, but also whether our powers uh, are sufficient. So that is something that uh, we will uh, keep under review, and I know the Secretary of State for Business um, is looking at it very carefully. Um, I think she's right as well about the September LegCo elections. Um, I've made clear uh, that we want to see them uh, allowed to take place uh, in the way that is recognised, not just in the joint declaration, but also the basic law. And uh, I agree with her on the, the point about uh, disqualification of candidates. Um, I think we also need to be just realistic, if I'm honest with her, about the likelihood of China or the Hong Kong authorities accepting international observers. Uh, she asked about Magnitsky sanctions. Um, it, it's not the case. She's simply wrong to say that the, we haven't done our homework on this. We've done our homework uh, since August of last year, which is why we could introduce those sanctions for uh, the situation uh, with Jamal Khashoggi, uh, Sergei Magnitsky uh, and North Korea. Um, and of course the national security legislation which we're responding to has only just been enacted, let alone starting to be enforced. So we will patiently gather the evidence. It takes months. It is not, as she's previously suggested, just something that can be done on a political whim. Indeed, it would be improper. It would be improper if that was the case. And of course, if you introduce uh, those targeted sanctions in this field and indeed any other, without having done your factual evidential due diligence, not only are they likely to be challenged, but you're at risk of giving a propaganda coup to the very people that we are seeking to target. She mentioned HSBC. She may or may not have already heard the comments I've made about uh, that. I think uh, certainly on our side, we will not allow the rights, the uh, autonomy of the people of Hong Kong to be sacrificed on the altar of bankers' bonuses, and uh, we, we, we urge uh, all businesses to look very carefully about how they respond. They're, of course, going to be nervous about any potential retaliatory measures that may be taken by Beijing. In any event, we're very clear on the path that we're taking, and as I said before, we want a good relationship with China. I, I think it's very important that we have a balanced, uh, open uh, debate about this in, in the House, recognise the opportunities of a good relationship with China, but be clear-eyed, as this government is, about the risks and what we do to protect against them. Chair the Select Committee, John Tugan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And may I thank again, I'm getting to a bad habit here, may I thank again my right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, for an extremely good policy change. This makes the fifth, by my count, that uh, he's back the Foreign Affairs Committee on, uh, which is the strategic alignment of the departments, BNOs overseas, Magnitsky's uh, protocols generally, and foreign ownership control overseas. Now, this is actually claiming credit slightly for his work, because he was so instrumental in many of these things from his time on the back benches. But given that his time before even entering here as a human rights lawyer, could I just ask why he hasn't yet made an announcement on the uh, abuse of the Uyghur Muslim population in Western China, uh, action that his opposite number in the United States, or rather the US Treasury, has already taken, and which has been campaigned on so forcefully by my honourable friend, the member for Rutland and Melton, and of course my right honourable friend, the member for Chingford and Woodford Green. Could I also ask what he's view what his view is of Article 38 and the extraterritoriality of this jurisdiction, of this basic, sorry, of this security law, and the implications for British and Canadian and Australian and New Zealand judges sitting on the Court of Final Appeal, and whether he's discussed that with his opposite numbers, because of course the application of their law, Chinese law, into a common law jurisdiction could make the position of those judges untenable, and it is really for him to advise them on how to act. Uh, can I thank uh, my honourable friend, the Chairman of the Select Committee, uh, for his fulsome support and his Select Committee's fulsome support for the action the Government has taken. Uh, I, I, there's plenty of credit to go around, um, but the reality is uh, we've taken, I think, a proportionate approach 
are one which recognise the severity of what's happening in Hong Kong, but also, in the way I described, <coughs> seek to have a balanced uh, and telegraph a balanced message to the government in Beijing that uh, our relationship is there with goodwill and with respect for international obligations to be a positive one. Uh, he asked about Xinjiang. We, we, we have uh, made very clear our position. Indeed, we led for the first time in the United Nations Human Rights Council a statement on the situation on human rights in both Hong Kong and Xinjiang. Uh, 27 countries in total signed that statement. It's the first time it's been done. Um, he asked also in relation to judges on the Supreme Court in uh, Hong Kong. That's something we obviously keep under uh, careful review. Uh, given the need and indeed the commitment in the joint declaration and the basic law for the autonomy of the judiciary as well as the autonomy uh, of the, uh, the, the, the legislators to be respected. Um, and so we will, we will discuss that with our international partners. He asked, I think, finally about extraterritoriality. It's not entirely clear, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, quite how that will work in practice, whether it would just apply to Hong Kong uh, residents uh, when they're outside of the country, or whether indeed it is intended to apply to uh, non-Chinese, non-Hong Kong nationals. Uh, and that is one of the factors, that, uh, amongst others, that informed our approach to uh, the suspension of extradition. We now come to SNP spokesman Alan Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I uh, also thank the Foreign Secretary for advance sight of his statement, and I commend him on the tone and the content of it. He picks up on the change of tone from the opposition benches. There has been something of a change in the government's position as well of late, so I think we should all recognise this is evolving fast. Uh, I would associate us with uh, supporting both the measures uh, in the statement. I think it is proportionate and fair. We also want a positive relationship with China. They are a key partner in renewable energy, as he rightly says. But they are making it increasingly difficult with the actions, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, with a One Belt, One Road over Hong Kong, the South China Sea, the situation in Taiwan, of course, and Xinjiang. Also, commercial piracy and industrial espionage. There is lots of cause for concern about the actions of the Chinese state. So we do support these measures, but I press them on three further points. Uh, firstly, on the Magnitsky uh, sanctions, I accept fully that this has to be done properly, but it could be done properly faster. And I think there is a need to accelerate, particularly in the case of the Uyghur uh, situation, uh, proportionate sanctions there. And on the suspension of the extradition treaty, this is not something to be celebrated. The breakdown of criminal and judicial cooperation will make the fight against organised crime, which is prevalent in Hong Kong and London, harder. So what comes next? Will it be a case-by-case -case basis, or are we looking to evolve some sort of new arrangement to deal with that pressing problem? Because it is and will remain a pressing problem. And on students, which is where I think this debate will get to quite quickly, Stirling University, in my constituency, and universities up and down the UK and Scotland, uh, welcome thousands of Chinese students, and we value academic freedom, and we're glad to see them here. Precisely that academic freedom that the state of China is looking to take advantage of. Is there guidance which could be provided to universities about the implications of having so many Chinese students in their institution, both from a security and financial perspective? And is there any analysis underway of the Confucius Institutes, which I believe do need a bit more attention than they've had today? Can I thank uh, the Honourable Gentleman and welcome his support on the two measures that we've announced today. Um, he asked about uh, Magnitsky sanctions, the point I made to the Honourable Lady, and, and I um, welcome the fulsome and uh, eager support for the regime that we have just uh, on this side of the House introduced, but with cross-party support, which we welcome. Um, I just uh, 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 call for a, just a note of caution in terms of speed. It's very important that these targeted sanctions are done right, not quick. If you do them too quickly, they will be legally challenged. Uh, not only will then they be ineffective, but you risk, as I said to the Honourable Lady, giving a propaganda coup to the very individuals whom we are seeking to hold to account. Uh, on extradition, the approach that we've taken, and I set it out quite deliberately, was that we are suspending, uh, not just wholesale terminating, we're suspending the extradition treaty uh, arrangements uh, so that it is clear that they could be resuscitated in the future. But as I also made very clear, we would need to have clear, adequate and robust safeguards to protect against the potential abuses that we see in the national security legislation before that could even be contemplated. So I think that is the uh, approach that we would consider. Um, he, he also, uh, I think, uh, referred to my comment about a different tone on the opposition benches. Um, I hope he doesn't mind me noting that uh, it wasn't that long ago that the Scottish Government as China engagement strategy called for Scotland to be seen as the preferred trade and investment partner in China. I sense that maybe there's a, a slight nuance in position uh, in 2020. Ian Duncan Smith. 
Mr. Speaker, can I unreservedly welcome my right honourable friend's statement today? Uh, he's taken the right decision. We've had a good cause to suspend uh, the extradition treaty, and I will now withdraw my amendments to the extradition bill. Not that that's been keeping him asleep at night, I expect. But um, I just want to also associate myself with my honourable friend. Uh, the Chairman of the Select Committee, on the issue of the Uyghurs and follow on uh, things that we may do. And it is true that um, he's right that he has to be very careful on the legal elements of what he does with regards to sanctions on individuals now that we've created the Medixi changes. But the issue really is that the Uyghurs and the Interparliamentary Alliance on China published the report on the forced sterilization of the Uyghur women a few weeks ago, and there are lots of evidence now of those officials who are involved in it. Could I encourage him, in line with many of my <coughs> honourable friends and those on the other side of the House, to do what he can to accelerate officials to look at this urgently and to look at the Uyghur elements that we may force sanctions on those responsible and on Hong Kong on people like Carrie Lam and her predecessor, Mr. Lung, as well now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank him for his support for the measures today and also thank him for uh, withdrawing his amendment. I uh, appreciate uh, his magnanimity in that regard. Uh, and on Magnitsky, of course, he's raising two different issues, um, which is one in their application potentially in relation to Hong Kong, secondly in relation to Xinjiang. We of course uh, have a process for uh, gathering all of the evidence uh, on, on all of those uh, potential cases. Uh, obviously in relation to the national security legislation, that is uh, newly enacted, so that will take some time. But he's right to point to, and, and uh, I've been reading over the weekend the reports by Amnesty International in 2019 and 2020 on uh, the range of abuses in Xinjiang, the reports by Human Rights Watch between 2018 and 2020 on the mass, determina uh, mass de uh, detention and political indoctrination, uh, and also looking at the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination uh, and their report in 2018 uh, around the massive internment camps uh, with no rights. Uh, so we are looking at this very carefully, uh, but as he rightly notes, it is important to assess this very carefully. And also, it's not just a question of whether the abuses took place, it's whether uh, individual responsibility can be ascribed to someone whom we wish to impose a visa ban or an asset freeze on. Others to come, Nigel. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It seems somehow wrong to be welcoming a suspension of extradition and exports. But uh, backward steps, though these may be, they are necessary and my party will support them. Never mind, though, the restrictions on exports, when will the government start looking at those materials that we are importing from China, in particular the materials for, uh, manufactured by Hikvision, some of the most intrusive surveillance technology to be found anywhere in the world and which was used widely in Xinjiang province and which is now being purchased and installed by public and private authorities up and down this country. Will the government look at that in a joined up way? And on the subject of Xinjiang province, it, the world is watching and what we are seeing is absolutely horrific. There was the drone footage at the weekend. Last week there was the interception of a sh shipment of human hair. I know that genocide is a term of art in law and that the Foreign Secretary is right to be cautious about its use, but it would make an enormous difference to tackling the issues as far as Xinjiang province are concerned if he would admit from the dispatch box that there are now a growing number of adminicles of evidence to say that that is absolutely what is happening. Can I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his uh, typically focused and uh, well-considered uh, remarks and also thank him for his support. Um, in relation to UK regulation and the regime that applies to imports, uh, we have a strong and rigorous um, scheme in place. Bayes will, of course, look at any individual cases that uh, he wishes to raise. And, and we are joined up, which was a question that he asked, uh, via the National Security Council and the other structures uh, in a more close and integrated way. And actually, COVID-19 has encouraged that more broadly across the board. In relation to the definition of genocide, of course, the real challenge with it, and I've worked on war crimes uh, since well before becoming uh, a member of this House, uh, Mr. Speaker, is the question of intention and, and deliberate uh, intention that is ascribed to it. Um, the reality is, um, uh, as important as that is, and it does uh, bring, it, bring in with it legal implications which uh, do help the uh, accountability, um, the reality is it, it can also uh, 
uh, distract from the fact that we are increasingly confident and there is a strong case to answer, as I think the Chinese ambassador uh, was unable to do yesterday on the Andrew Marr show, uh, of systematic human rights abuses. Um, and frankly, what the legal label on it is to me secondary to the plight of the victims who are suffering under it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I welcome the Foreign Secretary's statement as we develop a new relationship with China. The Foreign Secretary mentioned Uyghurs just once in his statement, but he knows that the whole House is concerned about the human rights abuses taking place in Xinjiang. If there, are, if there is enough evidence for the Americans to put sanctions on officials in Xinjiang, can the Foreign Secretary have sight of this evidence to see if we can do the same here? The Foreign Secretary, of course, repeatedly states that the term genocide is a legal term and we need international courts to apply this. But when it comes to the UN and China, the UN is a busted flush. So can I ask the Foreign Secretary whether he would consider convening an independent inquiry for us to collect evidence to see if genocide is taking place in Xinjiang? Can I thank the Honourable uh, Lady, uh, my Honourable Friend, for uh, uh, the points that she's made. Um, of course, one of the points around the Magnitsky regime that we've introduced is that uh, we have already put in place a uh, coordination mechanism so that we can uh, more regularly and generically uh, coordinate with our Five Eyes partners and share information. Uh, and actually there was quite a significant overlap, but not exclusively. This is the UK regime in relation to the designations that we've already made. So we are putting in place that coordination. Um, and I think it's uh, a reasonable point. On genocide, I, I've, uh, uh, I can only repeat the points I've made before, but I have also been clear that this is a gross violation of human rights. Uh, and China does need to be uh, answerable and accountable for it. it, it she, she talked about setting up uh, an inquiry, to I think, to examine the evidence and to, to glean it. I, I think we've got to just be realistic about what China would allow into Xinjiang. And in the absence of that access, I think it's very difficult to see how uh, we could do that. But of course, it's available uh, to all of the select committees in this House, uh, as well as the government in the efforts it does to assess the evidence, to look at that um, independently of government and, and, and indeed the United Nations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, anyone who saw the footage yesterday on the Andrew Marr show would have, would have found it chilling. In light of that, when the Foreign Secretary meets with the Secretary of State Pompeo tomorrow, will he raise the implementation of the Magnitsky sanctions on Chinese officials implicated in the persecution of the Uyghur people in Xinjiang? And does the Foreign Secretary agree that imposing sanctions on, on those individuals involved should be an absolute priority? Can I thank the Honourable Gentleman? So I've already raised with Mike Pompeo as well as my other Five Eyes partners, uh, not just the Magnitsky sanctions regime we put in place, but the designations. And we've also uh, given due consideration to cooperation on future evidences. I think it is important. This is an evidence-based approach. Of course, there's political accountability for it. Um, and so what we will do is carefully carefully uh, gather and assess the evidence uh, and of course we've set out in answer to his question about priorities the, uh, through a policy note which is published uh, I think in the Library of the House um, the criteria that we'll approach the policy approach and that stresses the, uh, the nature of the violations uh, the, um, the severity of them and also our ability to hold the individuals to account at the right level sufficiently senior so that it actually sends the right message. Absolutely. Speaker, I agree with so much of what the Secretary of State is saying, the need for balance, the criticality of China, respect for what it has achieved. But, but the signal truth is that the China we hoped for is not now the China that we are, we are getting. And not only in Hong Kong, but in foreign lobbying, foreign investment, espionage, industrial or otherwise, human rights, our alliances, defence posture, a much more significant reset in our relationship is needed. So can the Secretary of State just confirm, are we approaching all these issues piecemeal, or is there a wider reset? If there is a wider reset, can he explain how government is interacting with parliamentarians and outside experts, and can he explain how that more comprehensive reset is going to be presented to Parliament so we can all get to debate it and contribute towards it? Thank you. Can I thank my honourable friend, and he's an assiduous uh, a follower of China. Uh, I know he takes very close interest in it. Um, in terms of what the right balance is, I mean, he's mentioned all the areas of challenge. Of course, we could talk about universities, freedom of expression. Uh, there, there are many, but there are also, and I think for balance it's important to say, areas of cooperation. China uh, is one of the biggest investors, I think the biggest investor in renewable technology. If we're going to significantly shift the dial on climate change, China's going to have to be uh, constructive and indeed, I think, a positive partner, which we engage with. Um, 
Uh, he asked about more strategically, how do the measures we take fit uh, a broader strategy? Uh, we uh, are considering that all the time through uh, not just the SCO channels, but the National Security Council. And of course, with the integrated review, he and other honourable members will get precisely the opportunity to scrutinise the more strategic big picture. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I welcome the Foreign Secretary's announcement in relation to VNOs today. But will he outline the steps his government is taken to guarantee young pro-democracy uh, democracy activists who do not hold a BNO passport holder status will be afforded the same visa rights extensions and protections as BNO passport holders? Can I thank the Honourable Lady? Um, as I said, we have made a very clear bespoke offer uh, to BNO uh, uh, holders. Uh, the further details will be set out by the Home Secretary, um, and uh, she has already made some comments about the potential gap in years, but I will allow her to set out the full, full detail and then the House can scrutinise it properly. Mitchell. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I very much welcome both the tone and the content of what my right honourable friend has said today, and he is surely right to emphasise the importance of cooperation wherever we can and not uh, confrontation wherever possible. After all, we have more in common with China when it comes to climate change negotiations than we do currently with the United States. And will he emphasise to the Chinese authorities that the Magnitsky legislation and the human rights measures, which my right honourable friend has so ably and rightly introduced, are not aimed at the Chinese per se, but at human rights abusers and corrupt officials and business people, wheresoever they may be? My right honourable friend is absolutely right. I, I welcome and thank him for his support. In relation to the Magnitsky sanctions, of course, originally when this was debated, uh, the Russian government said that this was solely aimed at, at Russia. And when it was originally uh, debated and discussed and enacted in the US, there were different bill, bills in the Senate and in the House of Representatives. We were very clear in the model that we adopted that this would be a universal mechanism. Uh, that it uh, allows us to target the individuals, whether they're state or non-state actors, and does not inv involve us as a wider eco economic embargo or sanctions would do in punishing the individual people of, of the country. So this is a very uh, bespoke forensic tool, but I believe it gives effect to exactly what he described. Let's head to Scotland and visit Peter Grant. Peter Grant. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. History teaches us that we cannot stay silent in the face of what's happening to China's Uyghur community. That warning would be stark from anyone, but it comes from the Holocaust Education Trust, and that means that the warning should send a chill through all of us. Can the Secretary of State give an assurance that it will miss no opportunity to remind the Chinese government that wholesale abuses of human rights are not an internal matter for China any more than they're an internal matter for anyone, and that where there is evidence, as I clearly now is, of large-scale breaches of human rights conditions in China, then the rest of the world has not only a right, but an absolute duty to step in to protect the citizens of China as we protect the oppressed citizens of any other country on Earth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Gentleman is absolutely right. And of course, uh, it is precise, as I said, because we respect China, we respect it, it, it as a leading member of the international community, a permanent member of the Security Council, with not just the rights but the obligations that go with it, uh, the uh, commitment to international human rights law, uh, reflective in, uh, under the UN Charter of Customary International Law, uh, is incredibly important. Uh, and we raised this issue uh, with uh, the, the Chinese government. I've raised it with my uh, Chinese opposite number. Uh, in Beijing, and we've also, as I made clear, for the first time raised uh, the issue in relation to Xinjiang and Hong Kong in the UN Human Rights Council uh, in Geneva. Jerome May. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When the Communist Party of China decided to breach the Sino British Joint Declaration, they knew that they put at risk extradition treaties from countries that value the rule of law. Does my right honourable friend agree that whilst we continue to welcome China's development as a leading economic power, the rules-based international system protects us all and must be defended? I thank my honourable friend. He, he's absolutely right. 
And the UK has got a very strong reputation as being a promoter and guardian of the international rule of law. And I think it's a good guide, a good lodestar to our relationship with China, which is why not only is the UK grounded our response uh, to China in relation to Hong Kong in the uh, obligations freely assumed by the Chinese government reflected in the joint declaration, but other countries are doing the same. No. Mr Speaker, the measures that the Foreign Secretary has introduced to, to the Commons today uh, I'm sure are supported by all sides of the House, but I, I thought its preamble uh, was a little optimistic. I mean, it's quite clear that China and international organisations has the objective of subverting those organisations uh, rather than either trying to change the rules or obeying the rules. Can he be more explicit about how he intends to work with China when they have that attitude of undermining the World Health Organisation, the World Trade Organisation and other uh, international organisations? Can I thank uh, the Honourable Gentleman? I make uh, no apology for being stubbornly optimistic uh, about global Britain, including in our relations with China, but of course it requires them to live up to their international obligations. I think, though, he makes a very important point about not allowing a vacuum to appear in multilateral institutions. Uh, we're talking about that with uh, our US partners, our European partners, uh, across the board. And he, uh, he, he gave a few examples. The most obvious recent example where there was concern is in relation to intellectual property theft, where there was indeed a Chinese candidate for, uh, to lead the World Intellectual Property Organization. And actually, there was a groundswell of uh, uh, diplomatic activity to support the Singaporean candidate for precisely those purposes. I think that not only is it the rule of international law that we need to be uh, upholding, but we need to be working very closely with all of our like-minded partners yeah, to support yeah. the multilateral institutions. David Johnson. Mr Speaker, I strongly support these measures today. Can my right honourable friend confirm that when the inevitable pressure comes from China, both public and private, we will stand behind these measures for as long as the national security law remains in its current form? I thank, uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank my honourable friend. Absolutely. Uh, we take these measures. Uh, we recognise that China will respond, and that is why I was very clear about us uh, taking uh, well-reasoned, focused and proportionate measures in response to China's actions in Hong Kong, uh, but we're absolutely clear. We will not, uh, certainly in relation to Hong Kong, but also generally, we will not buck and bow. Uh, we will look for the positive, but we will prepare uh, for the resilience of our economy, our security uh, and indeed the resilience of our values. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I welcome strong action over Hong Kong, the Uyghurs, and to secure our critical national infrastructure. I am concerned at reports over the weekend that the government told Huawei that their exclusion from our 5G network was at the behest of the United States. Does the Secretary of State agree with me that when we take such action to defend our national security, we should say so clearly, and that it can never be in our interest to be seen as hiding behind President Trump, particularly as we leave the European Union and seek new partnerships. Can I thank the Honourable Lady, thank her for her support for uh, the measures we've taken today. Look, I, I, it was very clear from the original decision on Huawei that we wanted to reduce the reliance on high-risk vendors, uh, and it's equally clear, and we just need to be honest about it, that we've had to take the measures that we took uh, based uh, on the uh, technical necessity following US sanctions and what it did to the supply chain. Uh, so we'll just be very clear and very honest about that. Um, but there's a much broader challenge for us and our international partners, which is diversifying the uh, supply chains and the uh, telecom providers that we can build up a greater diversification of high trust vendors in this field and that's what we focused on. Chris Lodge. Thank you Mr Speaker. If, if we're for human rights we must be for human rights everywhere. If we're for the rule of law we need to be for the rule of law everywhere. Mm -hmm. So in welcoming today's decisive actions in relation to Hong Kong can I ask my right honourable friend for assurance that our commitment to pro-democracy campaigners and oppressed minorities across China doesn't end here? He's absolutely right. I thank him for his uh, intervention on this. And of course, uh, freedom of religion and freedom of expression is not just under threat in Hong Kong or indeed in Xinjiang. It's a broader issue and we continue to raise it uh, with China and indeed with international partners in the relevant multilateral forum. I said Gordon with Abzul Khan. Abzul Khan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I hope the Foreign Secretary has noted that almost every member has touched on the prosecution of Uyghurs. To me, this is pointing towards a demographic genocide. 
there is a, well over a million Uyghurs detained in camps who are subjected to some of the most atrocious form of torture. The Chinese government is now taking draconian measures in the aim to curb its Muslim population. So will the sector state agree to meet with the civil society groups who have evidence of human rights abuses in China against the Uyghurs ahead of the next round of designations under the Magnitsky sanctions? And will he raise this with the Secretary of State of Pampo tomorrow? Can I thank uh, the Honourable Gentleman? And um, look, he, he's right to uh, join others in expressing concerns. I made it clear uh, that we regard what's happening in Xinjiang as a uh, gross violation of human rights. I've already referred to the reports from Amnesty and Human Rights Watch and the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. There was also a report by 11 UN Special Rapporteurs uh, in November 2019 um, which uh, raised the issue not just of arbitrary detention but enforced disappearance and torture. We will look very carefully at all of that evidence. Hello, Brian. I strongly welcome this uh, statement. Uh, Mr. Speaker, whether it's the pictures of Uyghur M Muslim children who have been separated from their parents, or the horrifying footage of Uyghurs in chains being herded off of trains and into the camps, or the news that the Chinese government is selling the hair of Uyghurs on the internet, Many of these things, and I'm sure the Foreign Secretary will feel this very deeply, are reminiscent of the darkest moments of 20th century history. Uh, does my right honourable friend agree with me that as we work across Whitehall to think about all our different points of leverage on the government in Beijing, we must recognise first that they're on a path of increasing aggression externally and increasing repression internally, and secondly, we have to think that some of the things that we ha do to have the most leverage over them may be also the things in our economic interests, whether that be restricting takeovers of companies in this country or restricting their ability to extract technology from our universities. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that the only way to stand up to a regime that's becoming more and more bullying is to confront them now? Can I thank my honourable friend? He makes a range of good points. Um, and we will, uh, of course, continue to look at uh, all of them in the, in the round. Uh, I share his concern about the harrowing echoes of what we're hearing in some of those reports with what we've seen in the past. Um, we, of course, he's right to say, we need to use every potential lever that we've got to uh, try and positively moderate or change the behaviour of China. I also think uh, we need to be realistic about the size and the scale of China and whatever the debate in this House, the likely appetite and disposition, not just of Europeans and North Americans, but the non-aligned countries uh, in the United Nations. We will be at our strongest when we unite people together. Jim Shum. Yeah, Mr Speaker, the China stands condemned in the World uh, Court of Rights in relation to their abuse against Christians, against Uyghur Muslims. And this week is the 21st anniversary of the persecution of the Falun Gong, whose followers have been subject to commercial organ harvesting with the knowledge of the state of China, uh, backed up with strong World Health Organization evidential base. So will the City of State outline if he will consider sanctions to impose travel bans on its asset freezes against those involved in serious human rights violations in China? against the Falun Gong. Can I thank the Honourable Gentleman? Of course, as I mentioned before, the challenge will be evidentially not just in terms of establishing the abuses, but the individuals responsible. But we are deeply concerned about the persecution of Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, Falun Gong practitioners and others on the grounds of religion or belief in China, uh, including, I think, with the new national security legislation, the risk that that grip only gets tighter. For as long as China's gross abuses go largely uncensored by the UN Human Rights Council, will my right honourable friend ensure that the UK will continue to oppose resolutions made under Item 7 at the United Nations Human Rights Councils, which seems to be grossly disproportionate uh, given uh, that it is singling out Israel for special attention against its undeniably poor record, whilst China continues systemic, appalling institutional abuse against the Ouija people, and nobody at the UN Human Rights Council has anything to say about it. Can I thank my honourable friend, uh, and of course, as, uh, I remember well his time as a minister, uh, how what a champion of human rights he, he was. Uh, uh, the approach we'll take is to hold 
uh, the countries to account and the governments to account for the worst human rights abuses and so far as we possibly can and he will remember from his time dealing with the United Nations mitigate and avoid the politicization of those by uh, governments uh, and others who wish to subvert human rights more generally. We're now heading to Scotland to Margaret Farrier. Margaret Farrier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The decision to suspend extradition arrangements is a necessary step in protecting human rights, given the serious curtailing of freedom that has taken place as a result of the imposition of the new national security law in Hong Kong. Can the Foreign Secretary update the House on the FCO's recent engagement with civil society organisations in Hong Kong and what steps he will take under the Global Human Rights Sanctions Regulations 2020 to designate sanctions against officials responsible for human rights violations in both Hong Kong and China. Honourable Lady, um, I think I've already answered the question about Magnitsky sanctions. We'll uh, assess the evidence. I don't want to prejudge any future designations, but we'll look at that very carefully. We also engaged uh, and in touch uh, with various civil uh, society movements in relation to both Hong Kong and, and more broadly. And I can say that my uh, honourable friend, the uh, Minister for Asia, is meeting uh, Nathan Law later today. That's one illustration uh, of the engagement we've had. Good man. Thank you. By taking this welcome step to suspend extradition to Hong Kong, we're saying very, very clearly that we have very little confidence in the judicial processes of China. Could my right honourable friend assure me that he will be looking at other um, extradition treaties that this country has to make sure that there are no halfway house routes that China might exploit to get citizens with whom it disagrees back to Hong Kong or China to face questionable charges? Can I thank Honourable Friend? Most of, uh, certainly all the recent extradition treaty arrangements that we have already have an inbuilt safeguard uh, to mitigate against that potential risk. I hope that can give him the reassurance he needs. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I very much welcome the announcement made by the Foreign Secretary today. I was alarmed, like many others, to hear the Chinese ambassador to the UK this weekend when asked about forced mass sterilisations say that he couldn't rule out single cases. The Foreign Secretary has already said that he'll be looking to work with international partners on further establishing that evidence base of human rights abuses against the Uyghur people in particular. Can he go further and explain exactly what conversations he has had so that we can further inform our decision making and further actions? Yeah. I thank the Honourable Lady and I agree with her and I think the whole House, every individual, will share the disgust and the horror the idea anywhere, any number of cases of forced sterilisation and the testimony that we saw on the Andrew Marr show yesterday I think was truly harrowing something I certainly hadn't seen uh, before of that nature. Uh, she asked, I think quite rightly, about how we're trying to assess the evidence base. Uh, I think we need to bear in mind two factors. One, the evidential points that I've already mentioned. Secondly, the balance of international opinion uh, in the world. Uh, and of course, we can work with our traditional partners, and that's really important. But we also need to build up a groundswell of wider support amongst like-minded partners and countries, particularly those that share our values, but maybe uh, in the region or more broadly, who feel vulnerable to uh, pressure from China. China, uh, and that is a challenge and the, the way the debate is viewed in some of those countries and by some of those governments is different to the way it's, it's seen here. So we need to be smart about the way we approach this so we gain consensus and we build up a groundswell of support for the measures we've taken. And I believe that in the approach we've taken to Hong Kong, grounded in the joint declaration, the very specific obligations that have been violated, we're in the best position to do that. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Can I very much welcome this much more robust attitude that we're seeing from the front bench, because whilst he speaks about China's economic rise, it's coincided with the demise in collective sense of duty and responsibility, I believe, of the West. For decades, we've turned a blind eye to China's democratic deficit, its human rights violations, in the hope that it would mature into a global uh, responsible uh, citizen. That clearly hasn't happened. So can I ask the Secretary of State, is this now the turning point where we drop the pretense that China shares our values, given its actions in the South China Sea, given its veto that it constantly uses at the United Nations and, of course, ignoring WTO advice and ensnaring so many poor countries into debt. I very much welcome this statement today, but it is tactical. Can we have a strategic overhaul of our foreign policy in relation to China? 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank uh, my honourable friend? Of course, uh, I think in the previous administrations he was a Foreign Office Minister uh, during that period, but, but I recognise that he's always been very assiduous uh, and loyal uh, during, during that process. Look, he makes a, a reasonable point about. That's why I'm on the back benches now. <laughs> I couldn't possibly comment on that. But he makes a reasonable strategic point, and of course, the integrated review is, uh, is exactly the, uh, uh, an opportune moment to address that. I'm going to run this with another five minutes, and members are going to make others miss out. We go to York with Rachel Maskell. Rachel Maskell. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The catalogue of human rights abuses by the Chinese authorities is nothing new, and the extension of the national security law in Hong Kong is just the next step. So while the suspension of extradition and export controls is necessary, why has it taken so long to reach this point? And how will the UK government act swifter in formulating a strategic plan with international counterparts to make sure all those who are experiencing human rights abuses in Hong Kong and across mainland, main, mainland China are protected? Secretary. Um, I can thank the Honourable Lady, but the national security legislation was only introduced on the 30th of June. We're uh, towards the mid to end of July, and we've moved to not only extend BNO passport, uh, a, a path of citizenship to BNO passport uh, holders and those with eligibility, but we've also now taken these further steps on extradition uh, and the arms embargo. All of these things need to be thought through carefully. They require legal preparation. I believe we've moved swiftly, reasonably, and proportionately. Benson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I strongly welcome today's announcements and I thank my right honourable friend for his statements. Does he agree with me that China must adhere to international law if it wishes to be treated as a leading member of the international community? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, he's absolutely right. And that's the relationship and the way we want to calibrate the relationship, looking for positives, mitigating against risk, and guided by the international obligations, multilateral, but also direct bilateral, which in this case, in relation to Hong Kong, China freely assumed and now is in clear and serious violation of. No? The state will be aware of the important financial contribution that Chinese students make to our universities and research sector yeah, in particular. Yeah. Can you tell us what plans the government has should those numbers fall? And perhaps more importantly, what can it do to reassure Chinese students and those of Chinese origin in this country that they're safe and welcome here and to tackle xenophobic racism? Yeah, yeah, well said, though. Can I say that I'm very grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for raising this point, and I, my statement made it clear that we value the contribution of travelling Chinese, uh, that they make uh, both touristically but also um, in terms of universities and I think it is also timely to make that point to the British Chinese community here who are some of our most hard-working uh, productive uh, socially engaged uh, members of our communities how welcome they are and that we will have no truck in this house and certainly not on this side and in, in this government with this descending into jingoism or any ra racism against them they are credibly important member of our community and our society and to Stephen Metcalf again. Stephen Metcalf. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank my right honourable friend for his uh, very robust statement? And does he agree with me that not only is the national security law to the detriment of the people of Hong Kong, but it's also doing great damage to China itself? And that needs to be pointed out to them. Can I thank my honourable friend? He's absolutely right. And I think in relation to Hong Kong, uh, it is proving how counterproductive this uh, step is, not just uh, for the residents there, but for the uh, broader people of China, given the economic, financial, but also reputational issues at stake. Thank you. I welcome the government's new measures with respect to Hong Kong, but I want to press them on the gross human rights abuses in Xinjiang. We said never again would the world stand by while a state set out to eliminate an entire culture, yet it is happening again. So as well as accelerating the Magnitsky sanctions on Chinese officials, will he accept that giving out investment opportunities to new nuclear to the state-owned CGN is giving out the wrong signal? And if he wants to be able to demonstrate real seriousness about gross human rights abuses, he could start by reviewing that policy. I yeah, thank uh, the Honourable Lady. I do share. Uh her horror and shock and uh, the appalling human rights abuse in Xinjiang uh, and more broadly. Uh, of course, we uh, assess very carefully not just any individual investment decisions, but also the uh, integrity and the resilience of uh, the processes, and we keep that under constant review. For so, John Rebel. We make a study of essential technologies where dependence on China would leave us very vulnerable and then have a strategy for developing those at home or with our allies. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
He's absolutely right, and in particular in relation to 5G, but there are the other uh, areas, that's exactly what we do. In the Medicines and Medical yeah. Devices Bill, the Government rejected an amendment that was designed to stop human tissue involuntarily harvested from entering in China from entering the UK market. I have since met with the Minister for Asia and I am pleased by his commitment to it, but will the Foreign Secretary, in light of what he said today, make a commitment that if those amendments are reintroduced in the other place, the Government will look at them seriously?